Hello and welcome to the three-time award-winning Tough Girl podcast, which is all about motivating and inspiring you while increasing the amount of female role models in the media. I'm your host, Sarah Williams. If you love adventure, challenge and hearing from women who share their stories and provide top tips and advice to help you take on your own personal challenges, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. New episodes go live every Tuesday at 7am UK time with occasional bonus episodes going live on a Thursday. You can support the Tough Girl mission by signing up as a patron by visiting patreon, p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Tough Girl podcast. Keep listening until the very end as I share more information about what's going on with me with Tough Girl challenges, give shout outs to members of the tribe and recommend other Tough Girl podcast episodes. Plus find out about future guests. More information is available at toughgirlchallenges.com. Please be advised that in this episode, we will be discussing the Boston Marathon bombings, which took place on April 15th, 2013. This event resulted in the tragic loss of three lives and injured hundreds of others. I do understand that this topic may be sensitive and triggering for some listeners. Our guest Shandy will be sharing her personal experience of being at the 2013 Boston Marathon and the impact it had on her mental and physical health. I'd encourage you to prioritise your emotional well-being and listen at your own discretion. My name is Shandy Connell, and I am a producer of lots of stuff, I guess. A lot of commercial work and branded content. Um, Mini docs, short docs, feature docs, a lot of photo type assets and productions as well. I am based in Salt Lake City, Utah. And um, yeah, I'm here because I really love the outdoors. And a lot of the work I just mentioned takes place in some of the scenic locations that we have here. Have you always been into the outdoors? Because I know you're a bit of a runner and a bit of a snowboarder. How did that journey sort of start? I started running when I was really young. My my parents are both runners and my mom said I just, well, both my parents said I just had a lot of energy um, and I would just run laps by myself in the backyard. So I think movement was just what felt good to me as a young person and still does now. And so I, I started racing track and field when I was about five. My mom taught us to ski. We grew up in Canada. So um, in Southern Alberta, there's plenty of beautiful mountains and resorts to learn at. So I learned to ski, gosh, in like third grade, maybe. And then when I was in college, I switched to snowboarding. But yeah, I've run and raced my whole life. And I ran in college as well. And then competed in road marathons and eventually ultra marathons um, when I left school. So why did you change from skiing to snowboarding? What uh, <laughs> what, pro- what prompted that? Because I feel like sometimes that's like a, you're all, you can either obviously you can be both, but most people are like one or the other. Yeah, I think I was drawn to the the lifestyle aspects of it and the the way it felt creative to me, and just more like it was it just kind of matched who I felt I was as a younger person. I remember in high school, I hadn't yet snowboarded, but I would like clip pictures of snowboarders from magazines and hang them on my wall. I don't know. It just really spoke to me, I guess. So in the UK, one something which can be quite popular is to go and have like a gap year where you take like 12 months off after you finish school. Did you do anything like that and go and do like a season? <laughs> yeah, actually I did. So it was kind of like a gap. I mean, I guess it was kind of a full gap year. Half of it, I had an internship, but that was the only thing I had. So I was interning and then teaching snowboard lessons and then also just snowboarding on the days I wasn't teaching. And yeah, that whole year was just a lot of snowboarding and then a lot of outdoor adventures before I started my career. Was it hard to stop and like to actually start like a career? Or were you like actually I'm ready for a bit of structure now maybe? It wasn't hard. I, I mean I think there was a pressure of needing to support myself. So and I was very, very excited about the career opportunities I had at the time. So that was the goal, you know, snowboarding was a love and I've thankfully never made it a job and I'm glad I've never done that. <laughs> so yeah, I was really excited about a career. It, it wasn't a hard transition. What did you start doing in your career? Where, where did you start out? I started out at ESPN and the headquarters for ESPN are out in Bristol, Connecticut. So though the excitement like kept me going, you know, to leave kind of like this gap year of fun and start a career at a place that I wanted to be at badly. There's not a lot of snowboarding out there and definitely not a lot of snowboard or outdoor culture at all. So 
it did become a really big struggle after the fact. <laughs> but yeah, I was I was thrilled to start my career at ESPN. Did you know what you wanted to do? Did you know what sort of field you wanted to work in? Did you know about sort of the opportunities that of, you know, for example, being a producer? Yeah, I actually got, I studied broadcast journalism originally because I wanted to be a sideline reporter for the NFL and or college football. I really, really loved football. Obviously, I'm talking about American football. (laughs) So sports were like a really important part of my life for many years. So I studied broadcast. And then, um, you know, when I finished my program, I was at that point really into some of the back end stuff that happens. So I loved editing. And I was a video editor at ESPN in the digital newsroom, which this was 2008. So this is when the iPhone had like just come out for the first time and digital media was just beginning, you know? So I was, I was editing stuff for ESPN.com and ESPN2 and taking stuff from, you know, say Sports Center and cutting it and putting it on line so you can watch it from a laptop or and eventually your phone and all that. But yeah, I wanted to be a sideline reporter. I really ended up hating being on camera. I'm not a person who wears makeup and I didn't enjoy competing with other women for a camera time. So when I found like a love for editing, I think eventually at ESPN, any editor will know that <laughs> if it hasn't been produced well, you don't have the things you need. And I think it started to kind of spark my mind and and how I could do a better job to set myself up to edit better. And so then production really started to become like an important thing for me. And then I was managing a lot of vendors who were creating content for us. And it all kind of like came together. I mean, I learned to, to produce in school as well, but I think it really became something I was excited about when I was editing my own work and realized how much better I wanted it to be. And at ESPN, there aren't a lot of resources for people who worked in digital media at that time, or especially where I was trending at that point, which was X Games. Nobody really gave us time or attention. So it was all kind of like learning on your own, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was a long... What was that question? Your question was, did I know what I wanted to do? No, but to be honest, that was a really great answer though, because I, I think like initially like starting out, you've almost got to do the to do the time to figure out actually what do you like doing and actually realizing actually you know, I don't like being in front of the camera I'm, I'm not into the makeup like I actually because I when you were talking about editing I was thinking really but it can take hours to produce um you know to produce good good content and there's definitely such a skill to editing but how great to figure out that actually do you, know, you, you enjoyed it and actually it really sort of lit that creative spark in you yeah. I mean, I suppose reflecting back on it now, you know, you've what 40, 14, 15 years in the industry. What advice would you have for newcomers who, who are like just starting out, but they, they know they want to work more on like the, the production side, the editing side? Uh, what advice would you have for newbies? Um, you just have to get as much experience as possible. I think, like you just said, it took the experience to help me realize where I really wanted to go with my job and then my career ultimately. So I think you can test out all sorts of different departments, you know, within production. Or if you know for sure something is really making you excited, you just want to get a lot of experience with with people that you look up to and people you trust. And sometimes it doesn't always look amazing. You're not always on the funnest of shoots or in the best places or getting paid the most, you know. But I think most industries, the more experience you have, the better. And I, I feel like it's just a little more so with production because each job is so different. You apply a very similar process, but it is vastly different, like the things you're dealing with. And so the more you are doing this, the more you are experiencing, you know, bizarre situations that happen to us all the time. (laughs) And you're more equipped to know how to do it in the future or how to problem solve on your feet. So Anyone, I think, who wants to do anything, you've just got to try to get experience. Reach out to people you know, ask questions, and don't be afraid of questions. I think they're one thing I've really liked about the community here in Salt Lake is bringing other other people up in this industry. Like you know, I think a rising tide raises all ships. You know, I, I love that, and so the more that you can help bring other people up, like the more we're all gonna benefit together. 
So find people who want to support you and aren't uncomfortable sharing their experience and knowledge. Yeah. And then just keep going, get, get experience. So you mentioned, you know, when you started working for ESPN, you know, you moved away, I think you said to uh, Bristol, Connecticut, and obviously not a lot of snow there. And so you weren't able to continue with the, with the, with the snowboarding. But you've also mentioned one of your other passions was running. Were you able to balance sort of like your fitness and, you know, getting outdoors while you were also probably working these long hours as you were gaining your experience, getting your foot in the door, etc.? You know, how did, how did that work out for you back then? Honestly, a lot better than it does now. <laughs> <laughs> there is snow in Connecticut, but there's no mountains. So that was the problem. I would be excited about snow. Everyone else like hated it, but there was also nothing to do with the snow besides just kind of like get it out of your way. But to answer your question, when you start out at a place like ESPN, you're pretty low on the totem pole. And so my shifts were graveyard shifts for a lot of years. You're working nights, you're working weekends. I'd get off at like two or three in the morning. So um, once I did wake up, I had a good chunk of the day to exercise and run. I mean, everyone else was at work, you know. Also, I don't want to speak too negatively about the area, but there is not a lot going on and the culture was not really a fit for me. So it was hard to find people who wanted to do the things I wanted to do or who even understood the things I was doing, or even honestly, some words, I would say people seemed really caught off guard with some of the terms I'd use. So I had a lot of time (laughs) because I was either working night shifts and then I had the day to myself to do something. Or if I was on a more of a standard schedule, there still wasn't a lot to do for me on nights and weekends. And so the best and most successful running period of my life was out there because I had so much free time. And I guess when I say free time, it's just like, Social life out there was not really my cup of tea. Driving to a mountain was several hours away. So yeah, I the balance was easy. That's all I did. I worked and I ran. When did you decide to sign up for your first marathon? I was <laughs> dating a guy actually, and he had kind of just started to pick up running, I think a couple of years before we met. And I think he had already run the New York City Marathon once or twice, I am not sure, but he convinced me, you know, knowing that I was a runner with a college background and I never actually thought I would be someone who did a marathon, but yeah, he kind of convinced me and we did it together. Which one did you do and how did it go? It was New York. Yeah. It, (laughs) it went really well. He actually got sick around mile eight and I left him. (laughs) So it was great for me. He didn't have a great race. And then the year after, this thing just got better and better. So, but that race definitely changed my life. It was, it was, and I still believe is the greatest race in the world. Why did it change your life? What happened? It was just really fun. I don't know if you're familiar with New York City, but you run through all five boroughs, which in a city as complicated logistically and populated as New York, and you've got bridges and, and water and islands. It's a logistical feat. You run through all five boroughs over some really iconic bridges, through iconic neighborhoods. You're coming back into Manhattan on Fifth Avenue and you're rounding corners into Central Park. I mean, it's really, there's like, you know, 10 people deep on each side the entire race. So I remember my first or maybe even second, like by mile seven or eight, like my face was kind of tense from smiling that I had just been smiling the whole time, like my face hurt. And I tried to kind of calm it down to preserve some energy. But it's just each borough has its own personality. And one of the things that my boyfriend at the time taught me to do was put your name on your shirt. And so the people are cheering for you and your name. And it's really, it seems like a little meta, I guess, but it really gives you a pulse. It just like it, if you were low and people are screaming your name, like it does kind of feel like a unique personal thing when you are, (laughs) you know, physically really challenged, you know, like each borough has like a a different music or culture or kids handing out Halloween candy or Christian rock bands or gospel choirs or people doing magic tricks, people getting engaged. It's just such a huge party. When you hit Manhattan for the first time, you're turning down to first Ave and, It's just, it takes your breath away to see 
this long, like miles long stretch of road of this enormous metro area that's been closed down. People just losing their minds with excitement on either side of you. The streets are full of, it's just such a party, such like a, a feel good thing for people. And yeah, it was just so fun. I think, I definitely think there's like a portion of like, I did that. That was amazing. You know, that definitely is an accomplishment that I think can, you know, help you feel like, well, I can't, I can't believe I did that. I think what felt even more exhilarating was that I was seconds away from qualifying for the Boston Marathon and I didn't know it. And so the joke is that if I had left my boyfriend in the beginning, <laughs> probably would have qualified my first time. But anyway, it was, it was amazing. Every November, I, <laughs> the first Sunday in November, I'm like, you know, it would be so great to be back there right now. So what happened after you, fin- you finished the New York City Marathon, had a brilliant time running through all the boroughs, you found out you were just, you know, seconds away from qualifying for Boston. Was that the added motivation to go back the following year to try and get the qualification time for Boston? Was that something that really sort of excited you? Um, like a little bit. I, I can't say I cared that much. I was mostly excited to go back and just do it again. And so I did. And I, a friend of mine, we started training with a, with a book that was tailored toward Boston Marathon qualification times. And to be honest, I really didn't know what I was capable of. I was just kind of following this plan. But yeah, I did. I went back and I kind of obliterated my last time. I dropped it by 30 minutes or so and did qualify. And, and then, yeah, like this, this other friend of mine, we both qualified. We were both psyched, you know, it it always feels good to do things together. Um, yeah. What is like the rough qualifying time that you need to get? Back then, I think it was 3.35, something like that. And I ran a 3.12. Oh my God, that's amazing. (laughs) (laughs) Is that your PB? It is. Yeah. Yeah. Mentally, what's going on, especially, you know, after maybe like the first 20 miles and you've got the final 6.2 to go, when maybe things are start the body is starting to hurt the feet starting to hurt you know what are your tactics to to keep you going at that pace so that you can run a three hour 12 marathon I don't know that I have any except for to just keep going I think when you're that close you just kind of when I'm training something like fartlek or repeats or speed or whatever I'm typically telling myself to hold like I'm just telling my body just hold like hold right here And so I think that's something I do now. I don't know if I did it back then. I think back then it's just like, at that point you're running into Central Park and it is like, it is emotional. It's just the excitement and the energy. I think that for me at that point, that's the tactic is to just like take it in and just like, you know, hold your pace, just keep going. I I don't know. I've never, to be honest, I've never hit a wall. So I don't know um, what that's like. I mean, absolutely incredible running, running three hours, 12 minutes, dropping like that 30 minutes, you know, off your, off your previous time. I was going to make some quip about the boyfriend and thought, well, that's not very appropriate. (laughs) Was he on the start line the second time? (laughs) Um, He was, but we had broken up. (laughs) (laughs) Left him in the dirt. Uh, Part of why I ran so much faster is because I was fairly depressed and I lost a lot of weight. So I didn't have much to carry. And with with losing that social interaction, you know, like our groups of friends and our nights out and time together, I had all, even more time to dedicate to training and eating well. And and at this point, like I had asked my bosses, you know, hey, a couple months out, can I please have day shifts? I just want to try to like, give myself the best chance to succeed here. Um, and they were super nice about that. And so that helped too. But so yes, he was there. But quite far behind you. <laughs> yeah, I saw him. I saw him at the after party with all of our friends. And, you know, we're, we were still, we're still friends at that point. But, but yeah, and I think he was in a different, they, they stagger starts. So you start at different times. And I think we started at different times. So you've got your qualifying time. How long is it from getting the entry to Boston Marathon before running Boston Marathon. So how much time did you have to train before taking on the next sort of challenge? Um, First, just back up. Uh, Shout out to that boyfriend. Respect and love for him forever. (laughs) Um, And then to your question. So the New York City Marathon is in um, November and Boston's in April. So they're really, they're not that far apart. So you don't actually, if you qualify 
in New York in November, you don't run it the following April. You run it a year and a half later. So I had a year and a half and that was a lot of time. Would you like to share more about your Boston Marathon experience? Sure. Um, well, let me see how I want to, where I want to start. I think since we've talked about that boyfriend, uh, the breakup was really hard on me. And, um, right around that same time, I was promoted to a position with global X games. We had gone from, you know, stateside to events to six events globally. So there was a lot of pressure on myself there. And because I had kind of realized I had some talent with running, I had hired a coach and the next big thing for me was to break three hours, earn a status of a local elite athlete. And just, you know, uh, there was a lot, I had a lot of goals. I wanted to really do well with this new role. I wanted to perform, you know, as an, as a marathoner. And then I really wanted to overcome this like emotional heartbreak that I was going through. But that that's a lot to handle, especially with the promotion, which did begin to take a lot more of my time. When I was training twice a day, and I was on some pretty interesting paths with diet and fitness in this coach. And um, it all kind of just became too much. And I think I never really gave myself the time to process anything really, uh, but specifically, I think emotionally. And so by the time I had got to the start line at Boston, I was dealing with some pretty severe anxiety. It, I, there was about eight months leading up where I wasn't able to sleep on my own. I had abused a lot of over-the-counter medications for sleep and was trying all sorts of remedies, but I was breaking out in hives and rashes and having strong reactions to food. Um, and you know, things were really, I, I was kind of unraveling, but refused to acknowledge it. And in fact, I don't even know that refusing was an option. I just didn't know. I think all I knew was to push and to push and to just push some more, you know, and that's how you solve things at that point in my life. That's, that's kind of how I operated. And, um, I, I think it was a uh, halfway through the race. I realized I wasn't going to hit my time and, um, I didn't, I crossed the finish line and someone kind of came up to me and they could tell I wasn't well. And my, I not remember my feet were really swelling. I could hardly take my shoes off. Anyway, I don't totally remember much. I was put in a wheelchair and taken to a medical tent. And it was a, it was at some point in there that the bombs went off. And obviously this was 2013. And, you know, as I am laying on this table, or I guess this bed in this tent, my body goes through what my doctors describe as like a nervous breakdown. And so the, all the limbs of my body, including my neck were just like, it was like this painful, shaky, like loss of control. And so I was just kind of like screaming in here. And I had, I had a nurse on every limb. <laughs> it was wild. And uh, the the bombs, the first bomb went off. I think everyone kind of goes, "What, what is that?" And the second one goes off, and I had a nurse over my head. I remember she just kept telling me, "Look at my eyes. Don't look away. Just look at my eyes, and let's breathe together." And I think after that, you know, ambulances and just sirens and commotion, and and no one really knows. And eventually, I think it starts to become um clearer what had happened uh and there was an, an announcement made over the intercom and the tents to get everyone out to make room for injured people and so i i think i was in there like under and just under an hour i get out and my dad had been waiting for me there which was a little bit of a miracle because i was wheeled off in the wheelchair i lost track of him and my stepmother the person wheeling me turned me around right before we entered the tent. And so, and I saw my dad, he came over and waited. Um, and then he and I were, were kind of stuck with the crowds who were trying to go somewhere, which I don't, this is when the city starts to get shut down. And so we're like, I'm air quoting the word running <laughs> to try to find shelter or safety or wherever we're allowed to be because they're shutting down buildings and looking for the, the bomber and all this. Um, and you know, when you finish a marathon, you're fairly vulnerable from a physical standpoint, you can't really move quickly. So we're all like in our 
um, emergency blankets and hobbling from hotel hotel to um, train station to this restaurant to wherever we can be until we get kicked out. And it was it was hours long, so we we ended up at a train station where everyone was kind of stranded. You know, the trains weren't moving, and we were looking for my stepmom. We couldn't find her. There was a scare there for a minute. And uh, yeah, I mean, eventually the city opened up, and we were allowed to leave and go back to our hotel, which is just outside of Boston proper. And so that was that was the day. So much trauma that you've that you've been through, and you know, um, and, and almost like so much like being built on top of you know, not not sleeping, and almost you know, using that word like unraveling. But you had to keep on pushing because you know this is what you're, you're you're here to do. You know, to run the marathon, and obviously having that you know, in the words of your doctor, that sort of nervous breakdown, that loss of control, and then compiled with the bombing and everything else going on. I mean, that's a lot to take in for, for for anybody. What happened next in terms of your recovery and moving forward? Like, how did you move forward? It was slow. I, it's still a part of my daily life, to be honest. But I was on a medical leave for six months. I remember. <laughs> I actually remember being at work a couple of days after and my boss wrote a couple of things for me to do down on a sticky note. And he handed it to me. And <laughs> I remember getting up and crinkling it in my hand and throwing it at him <laughs> and telling him, none of this matters. I think I yelled some expletives in there. People are dying. People are dead. Like, this doesn't matter. You know, I think I was not fit to be back at work yet. And so he took me, we walked outside, he sat me down and he said, I think you need to go talk to our nurse about taking some time off. And I, I remember I was still in that, like, just push through mentality. And I remember thinking, sick, I'm going to have a couple weeks of vacation. It's going to, and I'm going to go back. It's going to be fine. And, um, two weeks turned into to three and to a month into two months and eventually to six months. And the longer I was out from work and the, the longer I was spending time with myself and accepting the things I was experiencing physiologically and, and mentally, the more I sought help because I, I knew things weren't right. And the more I sought help, the more I understood how much farther I had to go. And so they kind of, that process began and, you know, at that point, I, I had my foot was numb, like I think it was my right foot. And I had a constant like ringing in my ears and just like so much anxiety. And I would tremor really easily under artificial light or at a TV screen or even a phone screen, my, my body would tremor. And I, I found myself struggling to talk. Because it it's almost like I couldn't catch my breath. Like, I needed to take deeper breaths and I was just in living in a fight or flight, you know? And so I worked with a functional neurologist. I worked with a homeopathic doctor and I worked, started working with a, a psychologist. And um, yeah, it was just, I think, I think a lot of folks have turning points where they can choose how they want to react or respond and to start to deal with their own things, I guess, in life. And I feel like for me, I didn't really have a choice, you know, like this thing I, I, I brought up upon myself and then, and part of it. And the other part was just happened to me. And when your body isn't doing its basic functions, like um, your blood isn't absorbing oxygen or <laughs> it's not digesting food or you can't fall asleep or you're missing neurotransmitters uh, on your tests. Like it's for me, I'm already neurotic about my body and my health. So those things were just like really scary. And I had to learn kind of a new way of life, which was completely void of work and things to do. And I had to learn how to really dial back. Like I, I, you know, I'm a person who likes to be busy and to have a lot of things to do and checking things off on a list brings me immense joy. <laughs> and back then my to-do list could really be whittled down to put this in the mailbox, you know, because more than that was like, it was just too much. And I really 
learned to listen to myself and to, I think more than that, ask the right questions to understand what I needed and start to learn how to deal with my own emotions. And so it was a long road. I think the health portion was pretty painful. I think my blood was drawn 13 times that year. First time I lost my dignity by scooping my own poop into sample cups and having my labs done that way. And just working through all the physiological things that were happening to my body. I had 25 food allergies. It was just a long path to healing my body and healing my mind and even longer to get to a point where I you know, wanted to run again. And so I think six months into this process, Global X Games gets shut down. Sales didn't go well. It wasn't profitable for the company. And so everyone gets laid off. And I'm already like on a leave, you know? So it's a weird situation. And um, I'm told that I'm laid off, but I've got three months to find a job back with ESPN. And here's here's all the options. Here's how X Games is coming back together. And here's how it's not. And so everyone on the company had to kind of re-interview for the X Games positions again. And it wasn't right for me. And um, around like you know at around 6 months i was cleared stable enough to go back to work and my one of my best friends out west in seattle bought me a flight on my last like month before i had to make a decision to come out to utah where i went to school um and then spend some time with her out in seattle so and 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 i think it was then when i was here on that trip that my aunt i think asked me why don't you just stay here till you figure it out and It was this huge light bulb. Like I was here, I was snowboarding, doing something I loved. Like, why wouldn't I do this? I don't have anything keeping me there, you know? And I and I actually really struggled being there. So it was like a light bulb, but I just don't know why it took so long to change my mind. You know, I was so hell bent that ESPN was where I was supposed to be. That's where my career was. And I had given away to the fact that I was never gonna be totally happy again. I was going to have like pictures of mountains (laughs) in my Connecticut house, but that's where my career was, right? Like I was going to be there forever, but I wasn't. And I think the other thing, the other part of the equation that was really healthy for me was yoga. Yoga was incredibly important in healing my nervous system, kind of finding myself again, I guess. Yeah. And it was in yoga where I kind of made the decision. Like I, I saw myself back here and, and I knew that I had to respond to that. And so it was a big leap, but that's what I did. You talked about previously how your mentality was like pushed through. How would you describe your mentality now? Well, I think a lot of it is still pushed through, but it's different. It's done differently. It's done with regard and respect for other factors other than just like get this goal. You know, I think I, I got to think about how to say that. I'm a lot more aware, I think, of other people and myself. And I'm a lot more in tune with where my balance is or isn't with work and fitness. And I'm way more attentive to my mental health. I mean, I'm still fairly neurotic about my health and making sure those things are, you know, a big priority for me is very important. But I think overall, it's I think this is my answer. Running is just not that important, you know? Nothing to me is more important than your health. I definitely feel like if you don't have your health, you really don't have much. You can't enjoy anything if you're sick. And so I guess I feel <laughs> I don't even know if I'm answering your question. What was the actual question? You had this mentality of like pushing through. Do you have like a, a new mentality or a new way of looking at it? For sure, for sure. So so I think maybe the answer is really taking a poll on what's important and what really matters, right? Running a really fast marathon time is not more important than your health and being able to go to sleep every night comfortably, you know? So to me, I think it just really shifted into perspective the things that I need to prioritize and the things I don't need to stress too much about. And I think I think the other thing that it helped me see is like I don't really um it's not that nothing phases me, but 
when you're at that kind of rock bottom where you don't even have control of your physiological responses that you never even knew existed because they just happen. Like when, when that's not working (laughs) and you've lost everything, you know, your job, your social life, this person you loved, your ability to run an exercise, you can't even listen to music because your body starts shaking. I, I think you, I just have a different appreciation for, for a healthy body, things that function, striving for balance. And I think when things go wrong, I, it's not like to say, well, if I can handle that, I can handle anything. It's more like, you, I, I've done this before, you know, and, it, and it's going to be fine. <laughs> I, mean, I definitely, I obviously, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but from what it almost just sounds as though you're just being a lot kinder to yourself, like in terms of just what you're what you're choosing to prioritize, which is really nice, like and lovely, like yeah, uh, yeah, like actually, like doing yoga and sleeping and thinking, you know, what, it's not about the time, like yeah, yeah, yes, it's wonderful to run fast, but actually, it's just nice to go for a gentle jog and just you know be outside in, in the fresh air you've moved back to Utah is that where you decided to become freelance yeah and actually I kind of had to <laughs> I couldn't handle um full-time work right away so it freelancing was my answer to tiptoeing my way back into work and it just stuck so you work as a producer what do producers do <laughs> there's all kinds <laughs> For all different types of things, but typically producers are project managers for whatever field they're in. I'm more of a creative producer, is how I would define myself. And I, I work in like the film industry and the marketing industry, which the lines between the two are becoming very blurred right now. But I, I produce catalog photo shoots. I can produce car commercials, feature films in national parks ad campaigns, mini docs on companies or founders or products, tourism stories, uh, clothing stuff, beauty campaigns. So it's a nice blend of all sorts of things that keep me from getting bored. You founded the, I want to make sure I pronounce this right, the Altessa? Oh, yeah. Uh Uh-huh. Yep. Would you like to share more about the summit? What was the event? What was the purpose? What was the goals? Yeah, so it wasn't just me. It was a couple of friends and and myself, but it was a weekend-long retreat for women in in the mountains. And uh, the whole purpose was to have a place for women to come and learn about the outdoor skills they wanted to learn about and participate in without the influence of men, or, or I guess maybe even say the pressure or... You know, it was just women learning to do things in a a little bit of a safer environment for them and then feeling like they could go, you know, take these sports on, on their own. That sounds like an incredible weekend. How many people were there? Was it quite a big event or was it sort of more like a smaller, closer group? It was more boutique-y, I would say. Anywhere between 300 and 500 people a weekend. That's (laughs) boutique-y. That's huge. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess it wasn't like thousands, but it wasn't yeah. like 50, you know, it was, I guess, modest. And yeah, it was, it was a really good time. It was really fun. I got to brand the company and then run all the marketing and create all the assets and, you know, help with our copywriters and social media managers. It was really, it was really fun. Um, the company sold a year after and we went on to make another one called Pursuit, which was for men and women. And around COVID, that one kind of petered out. I was like, one of the things that you did was you created, I think this was, you did like a mini documentary with Rachel Collett. Collett? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Would you like to share more about that, Re- Reflect and Reset? Yeah. I mean, the purpose of that was to highlight the Otessa Festival, or I guess the Otessa Summit, sorry, and, and what it was about and who it was for. And Rachel it was a friend of mine. And she, you know, her story was that the outdoors weren't really even a thing for her until she got a divorce and came to Utah and met a woman who brought her into the outdoor industry, teaching her to climb and to ski and a mountain bike. And Rachel was a person I connected with when I moved back to Salt Lake. She, like, we met skiing, snowboarding for me rather, and we began mountain biking together And so I think this event, you know, she really encapsulated what the event was for women who are like-minded, who want to do these things together and share this experience and, you know, psych each other up. And so she was perfect. 
to just, you know, hey, this event is for you. Here's this relatable person who's coming and she's she's not 17. You know, she's in her 40s and she's still learning new things and having a great time and making friends and her quality of life is improved. So, you know, this event's for anyone. Shandy, where's the best place for people to connect with you, to follow along with your journey, to be kept updated with your future projects? Where should they go? Right now, probably just my Instagram. My website is sorely outdated. (laughs) When COVID came, work got really crazy. It hasn't slowed down. And I, I have not been able to update our projects. And there's been so much awesome stuff happening the last couple of years. So for now, Instagram, and hopefully one day I can update my website. Would you like to share some of those awesome projects that have happened, which haven't appeared on your website yet, but you'd oh, like gosh. to share? I guess really fun campaigns we're proud of for um, uh, companies like Mammut for Title Nine. I did a car commercial for Cadillac this year. I did um, a really fun shoot with Yves Saint Laurent, which is a you know high end fashion a feature film for Zion National Park. That's a big one. I think the trailer's on the website, but you know, there's not a lot, not a lot else there. Work with National Geographic. Yeah, there's a lot of outdoor companies here in Salt Lake we do work with. Black Diamond was was one of my longtime clients. Yeah, there's just been there's been a lot of a lot of travel, a lot of exciting places and locations, and most of all, like people. I think that's the that's my favorite part of this job is the people we get to connect with. Right now we're working on a big campaign for the state of Utah for Visit Utah. So we're spending time again in all of our national parks. And that's stuff that we love that's really important to me. And I think that's where I get to feel really lucky that I'm doing something I love for work as much as it is work from time to time. And it is that grind I was talking about. It I feel extremely lucky that it's still something I love. So there's a hashtag that's on your LinkedIn, which is in it together. What's that in relation to? Oh, that was when COVID was happening and there was just a lot of unrest here in the States over the murder of George Floyd, the treatment of the LGBTQ community, you know, the racism that we're dealing with. I I think, yeah, that was a LinkedIn kind of gives you options for representing yourself. And and I think this was a couple of years ago, I updated it to that. The point is for people to come across it and to think, okay, this is a safe place for me. Shandy, what have you got planned for, I was going to say 2003, but no, 2023? Hoping to land another big project for a national park area. Hoping to do a lot of work with them. I think for now, the radar is potentially full through next summer, but you never know. I think that's that's also some of the fun is the surprises aren't always the jobs that are coming your way. It's the jobs that you don't win. So you never know. <laughs> And, you know, you get calls every week about availability for this or that. So there'll be a fair amount of that. And that's kind of what keeps it fun and interesting is you can't totally predict it all. Absolutely. And Shandy, I'd love for you to have your have the opportunity to share your final words of wisdom, final words of advice for other women out there. And you can take this in any direction that you want, whether it's in relation to career, running, life. You know, what would you like to share? I think when it comes to career, I think my favorite piece of advice I got from a late boss at ESPN is that you'll never make enough money to be miserable. And I think, I mean, to give what I believe is self-proclaimed wisdom makes me feel really uncomfortable, but advice for life, look in the mirror every once in a while and make sure you're happy with who you are and that you are giving yourself what you really need. And if you can't answer that, stare at yourself until yourself tells you what you need and what you want and listen to it. Powerful words. Shandy, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast. It's been amazing to speak to you and best of luck with all your future adventures and productions and challenges. Cool. Thank you. Hey tribe. Just want to give you a little heads up about some of our future episodes and guests that we have coming on the Tough Girl podcast. On Thursday, the 20th of April, we're going to be catching up with Laura Maisie Pugh and her inspiring journey around the world, 180 days on the back of a tandem with her husband, persevering in the face of challenges 
and setting a new Guinness World Record. So on the 5th of June 2022, Laura set off on the back of a tandem with husband Stevie from the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin and 180 days later, she returned having circumnavigated the world with a new Guinness World Record. But the ride wasn't straightforward with closed borders, sickness, monsoons, sub minus 10 degree temperatures and a motorcycle collision that nearly ended the trip. It took everything for them to reach the finish line on time. So we first actually spoke with Laura on the 27th of January 2022. So if you go and visit toughgirlchallenges.com, you can find that episode, take a listen to it before the episode comes out on the 20th of April. And it will just give you more background about who Laura is, how she planned and prepared for this trip. And then on the on the 20th, you can delve into all of the details, what it was actually like, the challenges, visiting 21 countries, the day to day challenges, dealing with that ongoing pressure. We also do some quick fire questions as well. Um, so, yeah. It's always fantastic when you can go back and catch up with uh, with previous guests to see what they've been up to since uh, since we last spoke to them. So highly recommend listening to that episode. On the 25th of April, we are going to be speaking to Vivianette Ortiz, who is an outdoors and disability rights advocate. She's the co-founder of Latinos Adventuros. She completed the Inca Trail in Peru and she shares more about her plans to section hike the Appalachian Trail. Then on the 27th of April, we are doing a Tough Girl podcast extra with Emily Pennington. She's an adventurer, solo traveller and author of Feral, Losing Myself and Finding My Way in America's National Parks. So about the book Feral, it is a bracing memoir about self-discovery, liberating escape and moving forward across an adventurous and volatile American landscape. One year, one national park at a time. So after a decade as an assistant to high-powered LA executives, Emily Pennington left behind her structured life and surrendered to the pull of the great outdoors. With a tight budget, meticulous routing and a temperamental minivan she named Gizmo, Emily embarked on a year-long road trip to 62 national parks, hell-bent on a single goal, getting through the adventure in one piece. She was instantly thrust into more chaos than she'd bargained for and found herself on an unpredictable journey rocked by a gutting romantic breakup, a burgeoning pandemic, wildfires and other seismic challenges that threatened her safety, her sanity and the trip itself. What began as an intrepid obsession soon evolved into a life-changing experience, navigating the tangle of life's unexpected sucker punches. Feral invites readers along on Emily's grand, blissful and sometimes perilous journey, where solitude, resilience and self-reliance and personal transformations run wild. We first spoke with Emily on the 17th of December 2019. So if you go back and visit toughgirlchallenges.com, you can listen to her first episode before this episode comes out on Thursday, the 27th of April. Thank you again for all of your support. New episodes of the Tough Girl podcast go live every Tuesday at 7am UK time with bonus episodes, e.g. Tough Girl podcast extra going live on a Thursday. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out. You can support the mission to increase the amount of female role models in the media, especially in relation to adventure and physical challenges by signing up as a patron www.patreon.com forward slash tough girl podcast thank you so much and all that's left for me to say is wherever you are whatever you are doing give it your all give it 110 percent. get after it go for it believe in yourself because i believe in you take care lots of love and i'll speak to you soon bye